Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we come before you just rejoicing uh, in your love for us. We thank you for uh, being our Savior and being our Lord. We've come to worship you. We've come to study your word. We have come. You've heard the praises of our, our lips, uh, the praises of our hearts that have been going up already this morning. And so now we ask that the meditations of our mind might also please and honor you. We ask forgiveness of our sin. We pray that uh, we might begin to grow, to love Jesus, and to love you more. For it is in our Savior's name that we pray. Amen. Over Christmas, we got to have all five grandkids under the age of seven uh, come and play at our house. And there was this phrase that came over and over, can't get me, can't get me. And, and they were playing it as they went round and round and round. And isn't it true? Sometimes we say to God, can't get me, can't get me. And that's what we want to talk about today is what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. Our kingdom principle is that you and I have been sent to a lost and a hurting world. Kingdom principle, you and I have been sent to a lost and hurting world. If you'll take your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn in the text to Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. And as you do that, I, I think I'm just simply going to read it from the message. Uh, it uh, puts things in, in a way that I think uh, helps us understand today uh, what our responsibility is. Jesus said to his 12 harvest hands out with his charge, don't begin by traveling to some far-off place to convert unbelievers, and don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You've been treated generously, so live generously. Don't think that you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment, and all you need to keep that going is three square meals a day. Travel light. When you enter a town or village, don't insist on staying in a luxury inn. Get a modest place with some modest people and be content there until you leave. When you knock on a door, be courteous in your greeting. If they welcome you, be gentle in your conversation. If they don't welcome you, then just very quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. You can be sure that on Judgment Day they will be sorry, but it's no concern of yours now. Stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. You're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack, so don't call attention to yourselves. Be cunning as a snake and inoffensive as a dove. The text opens up with Jesus sending out each disciple. He sends out the 12, and then, Coach, I guess you're the one to get picked on today. Is that all right? No? Okay, then I'll go to Brad. And God sent you, Brad. And God sent you, Derek, and God sent you, Brad, and God sent you, and 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 you. He sent all of us. He had 12 harvest hands then. He had 12 disciples. Today, as we look at it, he has sent each one of us. We've been sent to a lost and a hurting world. So the question is, where do I start? Where do I start? Do I, I go to Tanzania, or do I go to uh, South America, or Haiti? Where is it I go? Well, it's not that complicated. It's just take a walk across the room. Jesus is saying, I'm sending you. 
You don't have to go to faraway places. You can go just across the room. Because you see, it's across the room in the factory that we see new people that are at work. We see people who perhaps have uh, lost a loved one. We see some that have been going through perhaps a divorce. There's all kinds of, of things that we see. You have been, all of this starts with a belief, you were created for such a time and place as this. You were created for such a time and place as this. Now, you won't always be here, and there will be some changes that take place in your life, but God has placed you right here, now, today, in the life that you are. And in that sense, we go to a lost and a hurting world. You see, the kingdom does not grow by great large groups of people. It grows one heart at a time as Jesus speaks to that heart. If we see a great crowd, it's not a great crowd, but if they are individuals who have been convicted by the Holy Spirit to come to know Jesus. You and I were sent here to this time and this place. You were created for that, for such a time as this. Some of you are thinking, whoa, but I don't, I'm not real wild about being where I am. Well, uh, you're not going to be in this spot forever. Uh, things will change, but right now, Right now, we walk across the factory floor, we walk across to the new teacher, we walk across to uh, our next door neighbor, for we've been created for such a time as this. And for what they're going through, we begin to pray and care for and love. That's how the kingdom begins. That's where we start. Not a long ways away. But right here, right now, one at a time. Now that raises a second question. What do I do? What do I do? You live out the kingdom of God right where you are. You live out the kingdom of God right where you are. In Romans 14, 17, and, uh, and Connie, this is going to be in the NIV, and um, you can just throw it up there whenever uh, it comes up on the computer. Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, the kingdom of God is not about all the things that separate us, but it's about righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Some of you have that one memorized, I can see. You see, the kingdom is not about stuff that separates us and, and all the junk that can get uh, between us and our personal relationships. It's not about that at all. What it's about is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Now, righteousness, that's a little scary word, isn't it? Well, let me help you understand, as, as, at least as I understand it, what righteousness means. Righteousness is loving God with all of your heart and soul and strength and mind and loving your neighbor as yourself. Righteousness involves two different areas. It's loving God and loving people. And that's what we're called to do. Now, we never really reach the point where we love God with all of our heart, 
with all of our affections, with all of our thoughts. No, we, we never get there. But that's the process. That's what righteousness is. Um, I was reading something the other day that really kind of uh, struck me that one of the ways that you can make a tremendous influence in the kingdom of God, love our neighbor, is by loving our spouse. Your marriage may become the megaphone for what God can do. In Ephesians, uh, it talks about... uh, our relationship with God is being like a marriage. And, and a marriage today can be a megaphone for what God is saying. If you have righteousness, if you have a right relationship with your spouse, people are going to notice. They're going to notice whether there's courtesy. There's going to notice whether or not... Uh, you care. That, that's just kind of an invisible thing that you can see, isn't it? They're going to see that that relationship is strong and it's powerful. Marriages are struggling. I don't think there's any question about that. There's stresses and strains and arguments. And sometimes you come home and you've been working hard and you're stressed out. Your spouse comes home and... Uh, he or she is stressed out, and you come together, and you haven't worked out the stress, and what happens? Got these little bit of arguments going on. (laughs) Now, we would never argue like that over those things normally, but when we're stressed, we do, don't we? Don't we? And righteousness is learning how in Christ to deal with that stress and, and coming home and really not having those kind of arguments. Stuff happens. Kids can be little and in diapers. Does that create stress? I think it does. I'd like prayer for you this next week. My daughter and husband, uh, her husband, get to go on a vacation a whole week in Mexico, and guess who gets to watch the boys? (laughs) We're excited, they are four and one. And they love to chase and they love to play football and and, uh, Abe really likes to play football when I'm not looking. Okay, it's zam, he gets me and he tackles me. And, And Abe is so quiet, he can run now, but he's so quiet that Gabe, did I say Abe again? Gabe and Abe, okay. (laughs) Abe and Gabe, well, we're on Gabe now. So he reaches up on the tables around us and he can't see at the top, so he just takes his hand and (laughs) whatever's up there comes off. And now if you don't set things back on the table, he might see uh, Abe's drink and so he will run very quietly. You cannot hear him. He'll grab that drink and pour it out all over you and or all over him and the garbage. Okay? Uh, Bless their hearts. Kids are absolutely wonderful. What a wonderful gift. But with kids come some stress. Whether they're little, whether they're teens, (laughs) whether they're... uh, Amen. (laughs) Whether they are adults, uh, the empty nest can be a time of stress. Kids get grown up and, and leave home, and, and you look at each other, and you kind of wonder, whoa, I don't know you as well as I thought. Who are you now? So stress happens. Stuff happens. But if we learn to let Jesus Christ work in the midst of all of that stuff, and he will, if you ask, to work in all of that stuff, your marriage can speak volumes. They'll notice that 
at work, you don't talk about your old lady. You don't talk about your old lady. You don't talk about the old man. You know, you always speak with respect. They can tell. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, and very often we can show that through uh, our marriage. It's also about joy. I'll tell you what, if, it, if you come at work to work every day and you've got some joy and you've got some enthusiasm and you've got some excitement in the Lord, you know what? People are going to notice. I was at a minister's meeting yesterday or Friday, and I walked in and we're sitting around the table and all of these they were all men. All these men looked like they had just been through the mill. And I'm thinking, there's not much joy around this table. And so um, one of our pastors, who is the area minister, uh, she comes, same thing. And Nancy's at our table, and, and we're trying to get a little bit of joy going, and, and John does a pretty good job, but the others just kind of, there was one guy who just kind of sat there like that all through supper. Now, I'll tell you what, if you go into a place and you show joy, the people you work with are going to notice. Isn't that right? They're going to notice, and they're going to say, hey, there's... Something different about you. Well, what's different is that the kingdom of God is within you and you are expressing the kingdom of God through your life. So there's joy and then there's peace. Um, again, let's, let's take your neighbors or the people that you work with. They can know when you're going through a storm, okay? You go through a storm and, and things are tough and... You come in, and you've got a heart of peace. People notice. People notice if your heart is at peace. The kingdom of God is not about meat and drink, but it's about righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so where do we start? We cross the room. What do we do? We show the love of God and we show the love for people. Now, here's the question that Baptists always ask, okay? Having been a lifelong Baptist, it's okay to pick on Baptists, all right? Because I'm picking on me. The question is, all right, what's it going to cost? <laughs> have you ever heard that? Uh, sometimes we'll have a program or something come up. Well, oh, what's it going to cost? Well, let me talk about the cost in the kingdom. Jesus said, and, and it comes across in the message, that we don't need a fundraiser because the equipment that you need is just you. Just you. Just what Jesus has done in your heart and in your life. That's what we need. What does it cost? Well, as I was reflecting on that and after our leadership thing Wednesday night, it just struck me that what it costs is simplifying our lives. Oop, this is kind of messy to get here. We need to simplify our lives. We need to discern between our wants and our needs. When we go to Kansas City, we always go out to eat. And we'll always go out to eat at Wendy's. And some of the wives are going, oh, you are cheap. <laughs> you are cheap. And, and yes, I am. The other day, The other day, we were at Wendy's, and if you just, while you're waiting for your order, just kind of stand off to the side and listen to what people say. And uh, there was this guy that came up, and he said, I need a half-pound hamburger, I need a large Frosty, and a double order of fries. Now, did you catch 
what's in that statement? I need. And we have gotten kind of mixed up on the difference between what we need and what we want. And it's when we begin to realize and live out what we need, a lot of things will uh, leave our lives. We moved, you know, last year, and uh, it was exciting to get ready. We threw bunches of stuff away, bunches of stuff. We got to the new house, it's smaller, we threw bunches of stuff away, okay? Now, when, when we started in the garage, two-car garage, easy to get those cars in. <laughs> okay? Now we're starting to get some stuff. I uh, have to have my, my little scooter in there, so I've got my scooter, and <laughs> my exercise bicycle is in there. Probably ought to be some other place where it's used a little more, right? Yeah. But it's in there, and, and I can still get my, my car up against that. The, the garage isn't that full, but can you see the process of what's happening? I don't, I don't know if you've ever reached the, the point where your garage is full of stuff. I've known people where it's full of stuff, and then they go out and order or uh, rent uh, a unit where they can store more stuff. <laughs> and uh, we're kind of funny. I mean, if you just step back and look at yourself, we've got a lot of stuff that maybe we don't need. We don't need. We want it, but we really don't need it. If someone's interested in an exercise cycle, you can let me know. <laughs> We can have, we need to simplify our lives. Now, we need to simplify our stuff. But what's even more important is to simplify the clutter in our minds and in our hearts. Sometimes, not too often, you, you notice, we have a time of silence for the congregation, and can you guess about how long it is before we start hearing a, a clearing of the throat or a shuffling in the chairs? If we get to a minute and a half, that's a long time. Why? Because we've got to have input. We've got to have input. Now, some of you are taking the input from me right now. Some of you are already working on your schedule for tomorrow. I understand that. Some of you are starting to get numbed out and the eyelids are getting heavy. Okay, so, but there are a lot of things. It just, a thousand and one things. Tapes from uh, the way that we grew up and what our parents said to us. And um, our schedule for tomorrow or some regrets that we had from yesterday or some, some hurts. And, and it all just kind of jumbles up. And what we need to be able to do is to silence the stuff in our lives. To focus. There's only one voice that we need to hear as Christians. We hear a thousand voices, advertisements and all that kind of stuff during the day. What's the one voice? God's voice. Just need to listen to that voice. And I don't know about your to-do list, but, but they can get really long, can't they? There's only one thing that we need to do, what God tells us to do. You see, being a Christian is simple. As we begin to practice simplicity, Let me give you some homework. This week, I would like for you to find a room where it's quiet. And I'd like for you to try to be, sit there and be quiet for five minutes and still the thoughts in your mind. 
Just five minutes. Just five minutes. Now, why? Because very often God speaks. He speaks in many, many ways, but very often he speaks in the stillness, in the silence. You've heard him. You've heard him. Yes. And the most powerful things that you can hear are from God. I, I've decided that it's not as important what I have to say to God. Now, he does care, but it's not as important what I have to say to God as it's what it is that God has to say to me. What God has to say to me. And it's in simplifying our minds. We can sit and read a bit of Scripture get silent and quiet and let let the Spirit speak. Sometimes you won't hear anything. That's okay. Uh, Especially on those times when I'm not hearing a word from God, I'll feel God. (laughs) He'll just pour out a sense of grace. It's just absolutely wonderful especially if you're going through a tough time. The times that I've had a very difficult times in my life, and I practiced, you might call it sitting before the Lord, he would overwhelm me with his grace and with his peace. But it begins by practicing simplicity with our things, with our mind, with the affections of our heart. So Jesus is sending out you and 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 you. He's sending out all of us, just like the 12 disciples. What is it that we're supposed to Supposed to start, we start right where we are because this is the place that God has put us for this particular time. And what do we do? We live out the kingdom of God to those people who are around us. And what does it cost? Well, it just costs learning to simplify your heart and simplify your mind so that you can hear from God, so that uh, whenever you do a discipline, spiritual discipline, whether it's prayer, reading scripture, or uh, sitting before the Lord, whatever it is, it's carving out a space for God. And if we don't carve out a space for God, we soon find that it's all filled with things or thoughts. If we want to know God, we carve out a time for Him. So, what are we about? We're about building people, as a congregation, building people who can build the kingdom of God. Okay? People who build the kingdom of God. Now, what do we do? What's the process? Well, it's loving God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind, loving your neighbor as yourself. And what's the process? Well, uh, we bring them in, we build them up, we send them out. Okay? We bring them in, and we help them begin to grow in their love for God and their love for people, And soon, along the way, they'll begin hearing from God about what they are to be doing. They'll hear a call. It may be within the body of believers. It may be in the community. But there is nothing, nothing that is is as joyful as discovering what it is that God wants you to do with your life. It's powerful. It's powerful because when you're doing what God wants, there's a sense of peace. Even when things don't go well, there's a sense of peace. What uh, 
What do you believe? Do you believe that you were created for such a time as this? For the kingdom of God is here in our midst as the people of God extend the kingdom one person at a time. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you, I thank you for your congregation. I thank you for your people. I thank you for all of our different personalities. I thank you for all of uh, our different commitments and how we've experienced you and how you've changed us and saved us and uh, are helping us grow by your spirit. We want for the kingdom to grow, but sometimes it's hard for us to know. And, and so we choose today to just walk across the room and help somebody that we see has a need. We choose, Lord, to show the kingdom through righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. And we choose to simplify our lives, to carve out time for you. We want to know you. We want to hear from you. We want to obey you. We want to love you more. Give us the wisdom to cut out those things that we need to cut out so that there is indeed time for you. We offer these things up in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning, uh, we're going to offer a prayer time. Uh, prayer can be maybe any need that you have. Uh, it can be... Uh, a decision that you're going to believe that right now you're in the place and the time where God has put you to be, okay? And if we believe that we're in the place and the time that God has put us to be, then we can begin to freely...